It's a shortage of grave notes. <laughs> you can make grave nuts at home. My grandmother's uh, recipe for ground beef came out very much like grape nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bruce, so how are how are cereals going? Yes. Well, uh, part of my problem is the nature of the cereals I've got. They're pre predominantly predominantly amateur productions, uh, with you know a different number of issues in each volume, and uh, some of them have been turned into bound volumes with no great regard for sequence or a couple of extra pieces put in in the back. And uh, my own organization's publication, just, just our flagship has had uh, eight titles over the years, repeating several of them a few times. And oh, uh, yes. other magazines got merged into it and then split out. And the uh, <clears throat> I've been exercising the 700 series uh, previous and subsequent entries, and it's just driving me nuts. Um, yeah, those um, 7XX linking entry fields yeah. and the complex relationships. Um, do you have access to the concert cataloging manual or the concert editing guide? Not even heard of it. Ah! I have, but about 30 years ago. <laughs> The, the Library of Congress has uh, put these out and they have some great examples, but I think it's a subscription only resource. Let me check. Yeah, most of what I've been able to find in the way of tutorials is about uh, uh, delivery prediction. And uh, we've, we don't have that many subscriptions. Mostly it's just you know trying to f make sense of 50 years of collecting. So, yeah, a lot of it is available, it looks like, for free. It's the, um, let's see, I'm trying to remember what concert even stands for. <laughs> I want to say Con is Library of Congress and Sir is Serials. The concert editing guide is an interpretation of Mark 21, but all serials examples. Okay. See that in the chat? I will give that a hard look. Yeah, if you go to the Library of Congress main page and click on concert cataloging manual, uh, they'll bring up quite a few things. I'm afraid I'm going to need them all. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And I mean, that something we could look at doing, too, is there are some sample, we, we've, people have started to put some sample cataloging records on the Koha Wiki. We could put some serial records, too, with a lot of these complex relationships. Oh, yeah, I've got one. We At one point, uh, we had 17 magazines, and we combined them all into an omnibus. And then a few years later, we split them all back out again. It would be a lovely example. Luckily, my husband here is also a cataloger, and he just looked up and handed me Cooperative Online Serials Program. Uh. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's hard to get cooperative when your serials have circulations under 100. <laughs> That's true. That's going to be original cataloging. You know, the, uh, the Metcalf Family Association's got a nice little magazine, and there's probably 75 members that get it every, every quarter. <laughs> How many of these find their way into libraries is dubious. And since it's based in the UK, libraries in the US is even more so. So this is typical of what I've got to deal with. Uh, on top of all that, serials were put into boxes as they came. And so any given title might be spread out over 30 boxes. Yeah. So it's, either I do a massive physical organization first, or I'm having to go back in and out all the time. 
We had a similar situation when a lot of our materials were sent to storage and then a lot were brought back yeah. in no particular order. And I found that unpacking and taking the time to organize was so much better up front yeah. because then you could see the title changes. Yeah. At least I'm making good progress in my authority files. <laughs> yes. I think there are also some Koha bugs about getting the uh, the linking entry fields to display properly. Well, if that's not working yet, maybe I got an excuse to put off the serials. Yes. I've also discovered the hierarchical geographic uh, link, and I think it's 673, 623. And uh, I spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out why that didn't show up in the authority listings. And I finally discovered that uh, it's the same authority list as the uh, 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 conventional geographic link. Which somebody could have told me. I haven't, I'm not familiar with that field. I haven't played around with that much. Well, it uh, when it gets to genealogy, it's kind of important to know what county a given city was in. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is a nice way to organize that. And now that I see it, it's tied into the regular uh, geographic linkings. I can uh, add detail there to so the people who want to know Barnstable County can uh, go look that up. Or if they look up Falmouth, Miss, Miss, uh, Massachusetts, it immediately tells them what county it was in. Oh, interesting. Nice. <coughs> yes. the, the, I'm, I'm fortunate that I understand my, my patrons fairly well because there's a... Uh, it's a fairly small subset of the, the general population. And uh, my wife's one of the genealogists. So she keeps, every time she complains, why don't you do this? It's just, I can do that. I will find a way. That is excellent. I mean, user feedback. In, Absolutely. Yes, yes. How people are trying to find, exactly. This is also why my biography section is organized by birth date. Because Interesting. If, if somebody asks about Carl II, is it K, is Carl with a K or a C, and which country? Uh, and you know, if you organize it by nationality, you could do a lot of hunting. This way, not only do is it is it not amb, is it it's disambiguous, and furthermore, it's on the same shelf with his contemporaries. And good historical research will look at contemporaries to see the environment he was working in. And uh, I've obviously there's there's a collective biography section, but I've got another one called dual biographies. Uh, because so often it's Nicholas and Alexandria, or uh, there's a wonderful title, we've got the Queen and the Sultan about Queen Elizabeth and some Arab prince who became great friends and had a huge correspondence. And uh, and yeah, they, a friend of ours actually wrote a triple biography mm -hmm. of people involved in uh, in Turkey in the Sultanate. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a book on the Four Georges too, but that's getting a little out of hand. Uh, How do you do call numbers, or do you? Uh, we've got our own system. Uh, biographies are under R for royalty because most of our collection is royal biographies. Uh, RB for biography, RBA autobiography, RBC for collective, RBD for dual. And then uh, except for the collective, which goes by author, the, the others are in there by the uh, birth date. Sounds like a complicated system to devise. <laughs> it, I don't know, it just kind of came to me. Uh, <clears throat> my, 
I'm, I'm fortunate that I had many years working in this library and, you know, seeing what the patrons were, were trying to do, accomplish, uh, which, which is a, a tremendous help. Uh, yes. I, I'd be feeling very stupid otherwise. Um, but uh, we're, we're fortunate that we've got a fairly narrow range of subject matter. Um, we have five major categories uh, and a, one that's growing called interdisciplinary, which uh, covers most of our own publications, <laughs> nothing else. Uh, there's a lot of things like uh, Der Adler, which covers uh, Germanic uh, royal genealogy and heraldry. So that's, that's a triple threat. Let's see, that would be um, Library of Congress C, Auxiliary Sciences of History. Yeah. Yeah, that's where a lot of our biographies are classified that can't be associated with particular professions. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> the line between royalty and exiled royalty and near royalty and royal uh, consorts and royal bastards uh, would split up too many, you know, I just have not enough shelves for all the different categories that you get from the LC approach to things. But then I don't have the LC's huge collection or their <clears throat> infinitely broad range of topics. This is, <clears throat> special libraries are fun. Um, they are. Um, you know, this reminds me, talking about classification, I've been playing around with different ways to search for shelf listing because, again, the Coho community helped me improve that. I had just been using a simple phrase search, but I, it was recommended to me to try the item search. Mm -hmm. And it works so much better, especially since we're under elastic search. And the item search will actually sort the Library of Congress call numbers correctly. Whereas if you just do a regular search in the staff client or OPAC under Elasticsearch, the call numbers are not sorted correctly. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So how how is your how does your shelf listing go, Bruce? Do you do you do unique call numbers for each? book or yeah i got a one to four letter one to five letter code for the major category and then uh you, most of everything is author and title for the next two entries and uh, things that are going by date would have the date and then the author have you thought of publishing something or putting something out there about your classification system? Because it might be of use for other genealogy collections. Yes, it's, it's still very much under development. And I think that uh, after I get the books out of the boxes and catalog everything, I will be able to put out an article on a much more robust system. Mm -hmm. uh, there, I, I'm not really aware of someplace where I could post about a work in progress other than here. Well, uh, we are interested. Uh, the Coho <laughs> Wiki would be another place. Yeah, yeah, I might do that. Uh, the last uh, special library I ran was on railroad history and model railroading. And I used the Drury Decimal System, named for George Drury, who operated the uh, corporate library for the largest publisher in the model railroad field. And I embellished that greatly. Uh, because I had to at a larger library. <laughs> and uh, I broached that to the uh, local library association in town. And they kind of looked at me like, but it's not Dewey. Well, we appreciate it. And actually, I think there is a Koha library in the Bay Area that's oriented on transportation. Uh, probably the Institute of Transportation Studies at Berkeley. Uh, no, they're on, um, they have, oh, I think they have in-house innovative and then, um, world share. Sorry, I had a phone call. Yeah, let's um, see. 
Ooh. Voices from the Ottoman Heron. That sounds like fun. <clears throat> yeah, I read it. It's actually a really interesting book. I would think. And, and you know, truth in advertising, he is a dear friend of ours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> one of my big challenges is uh, the, the LOC listing of uh, countries is pretty much contemporary and uh, when you're dealing in ancient history the being able to tell the difference between you know Samaria and Abyssinia and uh, <clears throat> the later countries that evolved into Iraq gets pretty important. Well there is some guidance uh, for um, what would they call it An you know classical antique superseded jurisdictions like Rome I haven't found that. I think that might be subscription only, but let me check. Let's see if I can find that. Because I've just been using cutter numbers for the, the countries, but if there's a system, I may as well join the party. Yeah. Go to um, loc.gov slash CDS. Let me see if I can. Actually, give you the right poke around. Yeah. Slash what? CDS, cataloging distribution. I'm going to put it in the chat. but I'm not seeing any link to um, antique country codes. Well, you have to poke around a little somewhere. Product categories. It looks like a lot of their stuff is still uh, subscription only. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the code list for geographic areas is free, but those are particular codes. Yeah, I'm looking under, those are used in the 043 field. And for example, Rome, you use the code for Africa, North, Europe, Middle East. Well, Rome included those areas at some times. Exactly, but I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to find is if available for free is the guidance for things like uh, subject headings. And I think that might only be in the subject cataloging manual or the subject headings manual, which I think is subscription. The actual, <clears throat> excuse me, subject headings uh, are available free. Yes. Yeah, you want to dig through them. Well, I'll give that a look, uh, another look and see if I can avoid reinventing a wheel. Yeah, I went to id.loc.gov and for example, there's Holy Roman Empire. That was IDC? 
Let's see, let me put that in the chat. Oh, thank you, Melanie. Melanie found uh, for free the Library of Congress classification and, and shelf listing manual with lots of good info and guidance. All right. Uh, okay. I'm going to spend a lot of time with the tr chat transcript today. <laughs> yeah, lots of good resources today. And there's also a subject headings manual, free files in PDF. Keep this up, I'll have to skip next month's meeting. <laughs> I know, we'll all have too much homework. That's okay, this is a high quality problem. <laughs> much better than not enough information. Right? <laughs> I th think no one else has posted this. I can't tell, but that's where the subject heading books are. Ah. Actually, downloaded the T once when I had to catalog a cookbook <coughs> for the medical library. The teas are medicinal. It's yeah. I think it was heart healthy recipes. There you go. Doofus, don't think about that. My old cat's threatening to become naughty. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My cat was down here earlier, but I think uh, the laundry basket's empty now, so he's probably in that. <laughs> well, I did find, I, I do have access to uh, Catalogger's desktop subscription, and I found in its index which parts of the subject headings manual refer to ancient jurisdictions. So I'll pop that in the chat. So extinct cities. Okay. I'll go digging on those. Let's see. Part of the challenge is the difference between a country and a city used to be small. Right. That I got time for. <laughs> we have um, a very small. You're you're mentioning the cookbook, Fred. We have we have uh, some cookbooks that are great fun. Of course, you know related to seafood. For those who don't know, I work in a maritime history library, so we have cookbooks related to seafood for anybody, or cookbooks about cooking on ship, or cooking on your boat voyage or your yacht voyage. Which which are great fun. Um, do they cover the era where everyone came down with scurvy and they set out with twice as many crew? 
<laughs> because they we, expected mm -hmm. half of them to die. We have a whole wonderful book. Oh, right. Oh, yes. Wow. I yep. know that. This we is have a real shelf. You need it. <laughs> We have a wonderful book all about scurvy, actually. I would think. Um, I, th no, I think I have the same one. Seriously, sure. you have a scholarship book? Hmm? Really? Yeah, because I'm just going to put it on the for sale shelf, and it'll probably go for a dollar. <laughs> well, right now, you'd have to mail it to me, and then I'm not authorized to go into the office, so I'd have to mail it into the office. So... Uh, probably best to just go ahead and sell it to someone local who would appreciate it. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> you know, I've, I've just got the Carter for sale books next to me because as, as you go through the, the, the boxes, you find amazing things. Yes. The, uh, we had a wonderful collection on uh, royalty from a member that uh, passed away. And it, it was the sort of thing that comes in oh. one of the pop one of those pods. It was that much stuff. Wow. And, uh, it was, it's an amazing addition to our collection. Uh, but there were strange things in there, including that battleship book. Uh, uh, Heather, yes, that's one I have. Great book. Good one. Yeah, I enjoyed reading it. Especially the part about selling rats to your crew members. Yeah. Does the cookbook involve uh, or talk about how to cook a rat? You know, I don't recall ever seeing any rat recipes, but now that is a very interesting question. <laughs> I I think I think some cookbooks like The Joy of Cooking addressed some wild, some small wild game. I imagine yeah. you could employ the same techniques. Yeah, yeah, squirrel recipes would work. Yeah, right. It's about like a squirrel. Except without the cute tail. One thing I've had uh, food related that I've had some fun cataloging, um, not so much lately as I've been busy with other things, but we've been digitizing some of our menus. Mm. Let me see, let me pull up a record and it's been really great fun. I should think. It's, it's nice to have a couple of things that will draw people in and uh, <clears throat> Hopefully, someone will discover the other riches. Okay, this doesn't have much to do with cataloging, but there's a website called Restauranting Through History. Ooh. It has menus. But not, not, not maritime related as much. I've seen some old recipes that uh, talk about the relationship of the age of the sheep to how long you need to boil the mutton. Mm. The, the ancient equivalent of the uh, uh, website I found that uh, shows uh, the effect of different times in uh, your sous vide. Okay, here we go. Mm -hmm. 
I've been transcribing the dishes into a contents note so that they would, those would be searchable as well. Oh, that restauranting through history looks fascinating. Okay, what is cabinet pudding? I don't know. See, in Rhode Island, a coffee cabinet is a coffee milkshake, but I don't. Yum. I don't know what, I guess I need to look it up. I started looking it up and I've stumbled across a site called Great British Puddings. Uh -huh. <coughs> that, that's a large category of food. Yes. Yes. We have a question. Is cabinet, yeah, it could be. It, hey, bread pudding is supposed to have whiskey sauce, so it has booze already. Yeah. <laughs> Except it came with uh, port wine sauce. So, yeah, could be. Thanks, Liz. <laughs> One of the books in my last library was Dinner in the Diner, which was recipes from railway dining car service. Ooh. Things like the Great Northern that served one pound potatoes. Remember you reading a recipe for the Salisbury steak that Union Pacific was famous for. And I'm looking at the, the kind of meats they mixed to make it and saying, I'd rather they left that as a steak. <laughs> okay, while we're going down the food rabbit hole, I'm going to also put a link in the chat for one of my favorite blogs called Cooking in the Archives. Oh, And I think this isn't an entirely unrelated rabbit hole because without the metadata, we wouldn't be finding these resources. Yeah, everything's related to cataloging. <laughs> oh, and one of my favorite bugs and bugzilla is related to food. And cataloging? Well, it's got to have the metadata. <laughs> you have favorite bugs? I do. I'm such a Koha nerd. I have favorite bugs. got my favorite bugs to be fixed but <laughs> well this one is called like... koha needs its own cookie ice cream and fudge flavors and people are contributing favorite recipes to it i oh, encourage yes. everyone to contribute i remember that bug yeah macadamia mint That's my toe. Stop chewing on it. 
<laughs> it's not a proper Zoom meeting without cats or dogs or some yeah. sort of pet. It's been fun watching the news and people doing interviews from their homes and, you know, the secretary of this and that. And the cat just calmly walks across the desk. Yes. <laughs> and he just sits there with his somber look like it, that didn't happen. <laughs> I think it was the COA US conference in Coeur d'Alene where uh, Chris Cormack was the keynote speaker and he had to get up at some like 4 a.m. Yeah. and he was joined by his cat. Yeah. Chris helped me do the my original Koha installation, the Reno convention. Oh. Wow. I could, I could make it work and he just sat down and walked me through it. Nice. I owe him a couple. <laughs> yeah, I was at that convention too. Yeah, buddy. I did a last minute presentation and then I was that time uh, I had an Ubuntu computer and I couldn't get it to project and everyone in the audience knew how yeah. the people rushed up to the podium. I don't think I remember you, but I remember the chicken. <laughs> chicken wasn't there at the time. It wasn't. Yeah. Uh, not till 2017. I'm losing it then. We're all such fans of the chicken that we just fill the chicken in to Koha events in our memories. Ah, uh, yes. Everywhere, even where he isn't. <laughs> That's right. It's the spirit of the chicken. There's the chicken. But the lighting's really terrible in here. I can't really you see. You're off that glass building behind you. Ah, uh, yes. I'm in a coffee shop in Boston. Sort of. <laughs> nice. Oh dear. I need to get me one of those green drapes. Well, uh, uh, d does anyone have any other cataloging questions, things like that? I, I think we're kind of winding down cataloging wise. Maybe I'll just end the recording and. Uh, well, Heather. Oh, yes. Hi. I, I didn't have a question. I wanted to um, <clears throat> kind of sing the praises of, uh, of a new tool that I learned about from uh, Monday Minutes with Kelly and um, Jesse. Oh, yes, uh, please. It was it's it allows you to browse the catalog for call numbers to make sure that um, I work at a community college in Arkansas. And we order um, a lot of books from Amazon. And sometimes you don't know what you're getting when you order from Amazon. So I, so I get it and it's not listed in OCLC. So I have to do, you know, I have to actually catalog. So it's- Oh, you poor thing. Helpful, um, <laughs> you know, so that I don't duplicate. Um, so I don't duplicate a, a call number. So I just wanted to mention, wanted to sing those praises and mention that. Um, mention that new tool that, that okay. it's new to me but you know I'm, I'm assuming it's new maybe new to everybody since they did a minute oh ago. yeah oh excuse me yeah I, I discovered it off that same uh podcast and i've been using it It saves me about 20 minutes a day it's fabulous huh. yeah yes thank you i should probably do it of course my library is so small that I figure if the 060B is, is sort of sort of right, <laughs> that's good enough. It'll be on the same shelf. Yeah. The only problem is uh, WY 18.2, which is um, nursing certification books. And they all go into that call number. We have a lot of them comparatively. But again, as long as it's close, you have the title, that's all that matters.
Yeah, the only problem with this new uh, feature is that uh, some of my uh, call numbers don't sort properly. Yeah, oh, and for and you, that's... yeah. And well, I'm trying to decide whether I can change the sorting sequence or if I have to change my uh, uh, call uh, call number uh, definition. Have you have you tried the that item search to see? Let me see. Let me share my screen here. Yeah. Yeah. I found this really helpful. Let me get my coha up here. Okay. All right, are y'all seeing it? Yep. Okay. Yep. So I go to search and item search. Scroll down here. Select call number and then have to be careful to use the wildcard character. And then for example, I've been doing a lot of sea shanties. <laughs> Surround it with those wildcard characters. Search. And then the results, when I sort by call number here, it's actually sorting correctly, unlike in the normal search with Elasticsearch. The normal search with Elasticsearch, for example, won't sort these two with the cutter M334 and M55 correctly. It interprets these as whole numbers and will put M55 before M334, because that's what it thinks is going on rather than M.334 and M.55. I can show y'all here, like if I do this. Which is what I used to do. Show off. <laughs> it, it won't sort correctly when we get down to those. Yep, M5, M55 is before M334. And R87 is coming before R483. The uh, dates of less than four digits, I've had to pad with zeros to get them to sort properly. I don't think that's mm. too painful, but... Uh, Considering I'm doing a lot of Ro Roman Empire, there's a lot in that uh, two and three digit category. Interesting. Yes. So in my case, sorting 55 before 338 would be a good thing. <laughs> How about BCE? Um, I use negative numbers. It doesn't work right, but mm. it uh, it it's a, it makes for smaller uh, tags. Okay. Oh, I'll also add that we're still currently on Koha 19, uh, 1911. We haven't upgraded to twenty point oh five yet. We're scheduled to upgrade on February 9th. Uh, I just stuck myself onto old stable and left it there. And uh, um, so I upgraded to uh, 25 when 2011 came out. I find that staying away from the bleeding edge is a good thing. Yeah. And uh, I, don't, I, I, I understand that a lot of people make a big deal out of upgrading. And I, I'm not sure why. I just run an upgrade and bang, there it goes. Uh, as I'm the only cataloger and most usually the only user, except 
for bots. Uh, the uh, you know the two minutes it takes is is trivial. And I'm curious to know why a lot of institutions make it make a big deal out of it. Is it just so that the staff aren't inconvenienced by the system going down in the middle of something? I think the upgrade process can be way more involved for consortiums and okay. uh, system, you know, sites that have some, you know, custom jQuery and custom XSLT because things like that can be broken. And then also one never really knows how it's going to go until you're using it in a really using it. And so yeah. a lot of early upgrade places discover some new bugs that can get patched before the rest and of us. It's my use of old stable. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure what we're on right now, but <clears throat> I had to move things around last year. So we have upgraded to the what was current then. But yeah, I, well, first of all, I always make a backup. Yeah. At least one. I'll mention too, Leanne put a neat tip in the chat uh, saying, I also use the call number browser next to the call number on the edit item screen to make sure I'm not duplicating the call number, which is helpful when you're adding a new item. Good idea. Could we go back to uh, you're doing the call number search? Of course. Uh, I'm not sure how you got there. Okay, let's do that one more time. Uh, escape my understanding. Okay, let's do that one more time. I'll do it really slowly. Share my screen. All right, let me rearrange things. All right, main Koha page. Yep. Search, pop that open. Item oh. search. I haven't seen that before. It's super cool, I love it. Yeah, neither have I. Is it something you have to add in or does it come automatically with the version? It it comes automatically, but it okay. is a pretty new feature. Well, and yeah. it has a lot of really cool options built in. And what I found is there's a there's a browse down here from call number to call number, which is helpful. But for shelf listing, I pop open this choice here to call number. And I use these wildcard characters. It has some tips right here. And I'll put in, and the one I was using for an example brings back a nice small list. So it's pretty quick. This is an area where sea shanties are classified in Library of Congress. So notice surrounded by the wildcards and click search. And then it not only will sort the call numbers correctly when I tell it to here with those little arrows, unlike with Elasticsearch using the regular search box option, which is not currently sorting Library of Congress call numbers correctly, these are sorted correctly. But I love the display. It's this nice tabular column that's really easy to scan. Mm -hmm. That's, that's good. So yeah, that item search is really nifty. And, yeah, and you can then also, uh, you can edit your search, which is really handy. You can export the results. You can even then export the results to a barcodes file. And once you've got that, then you could put that barcodes file into other Koha functions. If, so it's, yeah. it's handy for so many things. Uh, 
Oh, we have a question. Uh, maybe a question for another day, but I've been struggling to figure out what the A and B stand for after a date. Oh, that's actually pretty simple. Um, the A is usually for a reproduction. So you'll have, if you have a book that was published, it's call numbers, blah, 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 in 1930. And then you've got the online electronic book. It'll be blah, 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 1930A. Uh -huh. Then if you have, say, another reproduction of that book, say you've got it in micro microfilm, it'll be 1930AA. And then you got another reproduction of it on a CD, it's 1930AB. So that, that A triggers the reproductions. Then if you have two different versions published in the same year, say we got the the UK edition and the US edition, one will be 1930, one will be 1930B. And then we actually got the Australian edition, that's going to be 1930C. And uh, it's a little different with serials. We're going full circle. Yeah. <laughs> Where you don't have a date, you put that little work letter after the cutter. So if your cutter is L85, you're then going to get for the different edition, you're going to get L85B, L85C, with a little c. Those little work letters are tiny. And let me see if I can pull up where that's explained. I think it's in the classification manual. Yes, the classification and shelf listing manual section G65 preferred shelf list order. So does any, anybody have anything else? Don't think I can take much more. <laughs> My brain is full and I have another meeting in a couple of minutes. <laughs> well, I'll go ahead and end the recording today. Yeah.